Um, thank you for your patience with the whistling and so on. Hopefully we've got rid of the whistle, but we won't hold our breath just yet. As I welcome you this morning, I need to welcome one of our congregation who has had a midlife crisis and has decided he needs to change his name. Please welcome D. William Erickson. Why he's chosen now to change his name, only he can explain. But thank you, D. William. It's good to see you this morning. For our acknowledgement of country, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I've put a quote up on the screen and in a moment, uh, William Barton, the Aboriginal didgeridoo player, his um, didgeridoo piece number two will, will play. And I'd like us just to think about that, that quote. My concern is that our acknowledgement of country can easily become very mechanical um, and just words that we say and I'd like it to take on a bit of a fresh meaning. So technology willing, let's listen to William Barton and think about that quote. John, would you like to bring us our notices? Okay, so yes, uh, welcome to the notices. Um, there's a couple of interesting um, um, things coming up. Uh, with regard to say online electric vehicles if you want to find out about that there's an online forum on september the 7th 7th but also um this week um christians for ethical society it, richard refshorgi is speaking on the meaning of justice um on tuesday he's a, richard's a, a great guy um uh, anglican 
and um, he's, he's acting justice of the uh, drug and alcohol um, court in the ACT at present. Um, um, I'm preaching next Sunday and um, yes, no. So um, j just with regard to um, the minister um, formerly known as the Reverend Don W. Erickson, um, who now wishes to be known as William. Um, um, that's right, yes. Well, we're, we're not really sure whether he's pulling our leg or, 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 you know, whether he really wants to be known as William. But, but anyway, that's, um, uh, you can check up with him at morning tea. But I just thought you might, I might, I just looked up the, the, the saints with regard to, as to the origin of Donald. Um, and do you know that Donald actually is a saint? Um, um, but it, it, he's an obscure Irish saint from the 8th century who lived at Olgavy. His wife bore him nine daughters. Um, on his wife's death, the nine daughters and Donald formed a religious community. Um, the daughters were known as the Nine Maidens, and lots of churches were named after them. So an interesting saint, but I actually don't know why Donald was the saint. I would have thought his wife should have been the saint <laughs> for bearing nine daughters. Oh, and, and um, St. Margaret's News is, is, is out, so look, look for that. It's great. <laughs> Yes, yes. And Barbara's going to bring us a couple of words about the sustainability measures. So a couple of things from the uh, committee that I've been brought up to speed. Of course, I've been away, and so, but uh, they can't help but get me involved. Um, so. There's going to be uh, the Saturday afternoon, uh, there'll be, this is the 25th, John, is that right? 24th? Um, 24th, okay. Um, the creation service is on the 25th. The 24th in the afternoon uh, from 11 to four, there'll be stalls and there'll be workshops. And there's a couple workshops that are already sort of underway. One is a um, high fashion op shop. And they're looking for people who actually know something about fashion that could be there to sort of encourage and such. You know, I'm looking at you, Pam, you know. Um, and then there's a, a sort of um, upscaling sewing circle one that anyone that has that could come along and show people, kids, especially how to sew on buttons, if they've got an upscale pro up, up cycling, uh, which is you turn something else in something that's used into something else. One of the things I've been, uh, I've been granted is a, from my dear daughter, is a, is a handbag made from a pair of jeans, which is pretty cool. Uh, so anything like that, and if you have any other ideas of things that you would like to do in that in that uh, you know little workshop, please please let us know. And so they're also looking for just help. Uh, there'll be a St. Margaret's Holy Cross stall. There's going to be people that need to be for setting up um, and uh, taking things down. And um, and like I say, if there's any other ideas. And we also, there's also some question, they would like to have food, but there's um, not any idea of who yet they can get to do that. So uh, if there's suggestions for that, please let me know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Let's enter into our worship with our call to worship. 
All who are bent over with worry, this is a house of sanctuary. All who are burdened with life, this is a house of care. All who are lost to community, this is a company of welcome. All who travel with questions, this is a community of seekers. All who reach out for God, this is a sacred space of worship. Come, let us worship. Amen. And we open our singing with Gather This Day, which is to the tune of O Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness. And the peace of the Lord, who is with us in all our struggles, the peace of God be with you. Let's share the peace. Given that we were walking, John, I'm sure we would have noticed. <laughs> and now Brian will bring us our prayers of giving thanks and saying sorry. Let's join in prayer. Lord God of us all, gathered in this place in a spirit of holiness, we offer you our praise and thanks and we make our confessions. Loving God, gathered in this church and coming to prayer, we recognize your greatness and seek the safety, security, care, 
compassion and love that you provide. Cherished God, as we are gathered together, we sense serenity, we walk hand in hand, thankful for the many blessings you generously offer to us. Provider God, gathered in hopefulness, we are aware of those for whom every day brings more challenges, those who struggle with serious physical and mental health issues, those fighting or fleeing wars, those battling the consequences of climate change wherever they live. We bring our doubts and long to have them relieved. We bring our pain and long to be comforted. We have much to confess. We still worry about COVID-19 and its impacts. We worry about the extraordinary attitude and behaviour of some so-called leaders here and in other countries. We continue to worry about the war in the Ukraine and its impacts. We worry about the future that our children and grandchildren will experience. Lord, we confess our failure to properly see the world you need us to create. A world where the meek and lowly are lifted up, where the poor and hungry are filled with good things, where the disadvantaged and tyrannised might be safe and secure. Lord of all, forgive us and others when we worry too much, when we allow our leaders to get away with their bad behaviour, when we do not respond adequately to the needs of others when we overlook important things and focus too much on our personal lives. We ask you to assist us to learn that we might seek to nourish our souls with the hope that comes from you through crying out in honest, searching prayer. Blessed Lord, knowing that you forgive us for our sins, we give you thanks. We are filled with gratitude for that forgiveness, for the many blessings we always receive from you, for the fresh opportunities you provide for us to do what is right, standing together and walking hand in hand, learning afresh to see what your world offers, caring with courage and loving all your children. May we live in the knowledge of your forgiveness, your love. And through Christ Jesus, we pray and we offer ourselves words of assurance. You, our Lord, are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You, our Lord, are the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? Amen. Thank you, Brian. For our Echo Minute this morning, it's, it's not quite an Echo Minute, but a minute about some of the potential consequences of an Echo disaster. Can we whip on to the next slide, Julie? Can you sing the song? Of course you can. We're happy little Vegemites. It's a right in every tree. Everyone has their way of eating Vegemite, even straight from the jar. But there's one thing we all agree on, we love our Vegemite. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Happy little veggie mites, as bright as bright can be. Turns out that the jingle is almost correct. Correct enough anyway for uh, Victoria University and a few other universities to be doing quite a lot of research into it. Because they've found that 
people who eat yeast-based spreads like Vegemite and the other one whose name shall not be spoken from um, the UK have lower levels of stress and anxiety compared with those who don't. Of course, the key is not the label Vegemite. The key is the vitamin B of which Vegemite is a, a fantastic source. The professor leading up the group, Professor Felice Jacker, said the research we've done for nearly a decade now shows that the quality of your diet is associated with your risk of depression very clearly. That holds true across countries, across cultures, across age groups, and is not explained by things like education or income. Depression has long been treated with medication and talking therapies, and they're not going anywhere just yet. But we're beginning to understand that increasing how much exercise we get and switching to a healthy diet with plenty of vitamin B can play an important role in treating and even preventing depression. And with a climate crisis approaching and COVID not yet gone despite the um, hopes in our minds, depression as we know is an enormous issue in our society. Beverly is going to bring us our readings. Firstly, reading from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Oh, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. I am only, I do not know how or what or where. I am only... I cannot go, I'm too afraid. I am only, I have not height or voice or strength. I am only, I am little, broken, old, young. I am only, I will not be welcomed, heard, or heeded. I am only, they are more, so much more than me. I am only, but I am listening. I will trust you when you call, for I am only who I am, and with you I am not alone. reading from Luke 13, verses 10 to 17. <clears throat> he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with the spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, 
you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. These are the words of our faith. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The wonderful American hymn writer, Carolyn Gillette, has put this story into a hymn to a really familiar tune and I thought as a lead into our reflection we would sing it. It's called That Woman in the Crowd. Looking again at the words of that hymn, it strikes me there's 
really a reflection just in that hymn, isn't there? My name is Nan Earl. I was a child prodigy playing and writing music. I toured Europe with my younger brother, gathering rave reviews for my talent. Most of the time I was the top of the bill. Then I turned 18 years old. My father said I had to stay home. It wasn't right for me to appear in public anymore. None of my music has survived. I am Nan Earl Mozart, but I am only a girl. Not many people know my name. I write poems. I don't know if they're any good, but they give me a chance to express myself. I can't talk very well and I'm not good with people. I used to sell my poems at the shops, but because I'm big, people got a bit scared when I approached with my poems held out. I don't sell them anymore, but I am only someone with a disability. My name is Annie. <clears throat> I was born into poverty and contracted tr trachoma at the age of five. It left my eyesight permanently damaged. Mum died when I was eight. Dad couldn't cope, so soon after I was sent to a poorhouse with my younger brother, Jimmy. Jimmy died four months later and I was alone. People scared me. I couldn't see them properly, so I got aggressive. I spent some time locked in a cage at the almshouse with my food pushed through the bars. It was a horrible place. Finally, the authorities closed it down and I got my greatest wish. I went to a school, a school that taught, <coughs> excuse me, a school that taught blind people. School was hard as I didn't have very good manners and I didn't know what to do, but I kept going and graduated as a teacher. The school principal then recommended me to a position as, a, as teacher and companion to a seven-year-old girl who was blind and deaf. After lots of hard work, she became famous. I was her companion and teacher for 49 years. <clears throat> I am Annie Sullivan. My pupil's name was, Heaven, was Helen Keller but I am only a girl with a disability. Thank you, Julie. I could go on. Greta Thunberg, only a schoolgirl. Dylan Alcott, only a mouthy kid in a wheelchair, and so on and so on. Today's readings examine the way, examine us, sorry, today's readings invite us to examine the way we see, the way we see ourselves, the way we see others, the way we see situations, and the way we see rules and traditions. It also invites us to look at how we respond how we deal with those who are different, how we deal with the others in our society. When we read the healing story in the gospel this morning about the woman who was bent over and Jesus' healing, our tendency always is to side with Jesus and the woman and the supportive crowd and against Jesus' opponents perhaps even to be a little bit glad that they were showing up. After all, they are wrong. Jesus is right when someone is suffering, healing is more important than the letter of the law. Because isn't worship at its best when it transforms us and lifts us into the potential for new life, not when it maintains the status quo? 
In one of his bleakest poems, The Four Quartets, T.S. Eliot comments of time and the past that we had the experience, but we missed the meaning. I'll repeat that. We had the experience, but we missed the meaning. Sadly, for the synagogue leader, this seems to describe him. But I think the challenge is for us to ask ourselves, does it also too often describe us? Perhaps instead of rejoicing over one in one person's exaltation over the other, we could simply aim for kindness and healing in this complex broken world where everyone needs simultaneously to be exalted and to be humbled. Perhaps grace and love need to replace judgment in our assessment of those who appear to be our opponents. Perhaps we could focus on seeing what God reveals to us, no matter where our gaze is aimed, no matter how tall we stand. Seeing the value and image of God in all people. Maybe when we notice the person next to us stoop down, we might take on some of the burden without judging the worthiness. Perhaps that's where the real healing begins. Healing for us as well as for others. Because I imagine when that stooped up woman stands tall and takes in the wide world around her properly for the first time in 18 years, she sees much more than just the kind eyes of a friend or fluffy clouds in a bright sky. She also sees the breadth of suffering in her world, the expansive margins that are home to the most vulnerable and the depth of disease and distress all around her. She sees that she has been raised tall into a broken world. And her widened perspective includes new responsibility and new regrets. A perspective that, he, that requires broader em empathy and engagement. Freed from her disease, she is now free to serve a world in profound need. She is now equipped to give as well as to receive an ability to really see, to really understand, to really place herself in the place of those suffering and marginalized and an ability to help. A couple of other brief questions to think about before I return to the, to the story again. If for us, the Sabbath is not a rule that gets in our way. Is it possible that like the leader of the synagogue, we also sometimes hide behind other rules which keep us from doing what we know Jesus would want us to do? Are there ways sometimes in which the rules that we follow help keep the status quo? help make sure that the boat doesn't get rocked? Indeed, are there ways in which our rules keep the privileged privileged and don't allow a way in for those who are not so privileged? Do our structures sometimes prevent us from even seeing them? Secondly, one of the interesting things in this story is that the woman doesn't ask for healing. Jesus goes up to her, a real departure from, I think, every other healing story in, in, in the Gospels. I wonder if 
we've ever experienced healing that we never even thought to ask for. I wonder if there are parts and pieces in our lives and in our experience which beg for healing, but in resignation or despair, we've simply got to the stage where we just stop asking. Thirdly, I wonder if the healing touch of Jesus might, ac might actually enable us to see something or see someone we haven't seen before. Something wondrous to enjoy, some injustice to be spoken about. How do we open ourselves to this healing way of seeing? The story essentially portrays Jesus as keeping the Sabbath because he sees it differently. It's not whether, but how to keep the Sabbath. Because Jesus recognises that the Sabbath is essentially a gift of freedom, not a gift of rules and constraints. The body-bent woman realised that also. Because true Sabbath means freeing one to be with God, freeing us from afflictions, from bent over bodies or from starved, so from starved souls or from clocks or from commitments or from tensions or from worries. It means giving us the freedom to look beyond where we are. Because you see, we're all body bent, whether it be physical, emotional or spiritual. We all have afflictions from which we need to be freed. And God can do that. God does it all the time. We just have to pay attention and let go so that the healing work can happen. And then we can experience the freedom that God created for us. Freedom to see, freedom to love, freedom to act. I'll leave the last word to the great Catholic activist, Dorothy Day. She said, in the end, I only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. I'll say that again. I, in the end, I only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. That makes us think, doesn't it? Amen. For our reflective song this morning, we go to sing a song called Jesus the Healer, which I understand from our musical gurus is relatively simple. And the, our choir is going to sing the plain text and we will respond with the sections in bold.
Thank you, Robin. Just before I start the prayers, I want to say thank you to everybody who bought soup, slices, and lots of other good things to eat last Sunday. What well, was our last soup lunch for the for this winter? We wait again now for next March, April, May, or May, June, July, something like that. We raised $104 last week, which we will have to decide, probably the church council will decide where that will go, some charity that we uh, would like to support. Um, and the second, more importantly, I want you to all think about Alf and Shirley. They're in a very bad way at the moment. Alf in hospital, having had another uh, serious medical episode. Shirley can't visit him because she's confined to bed with a very bad leg. She's had operated on twice. She can't get out of bed. Just her daughter and her family live on the same block. Um, her daughter's helping her, but her daughter's getting very, very tired. I think she's a teacher and she's constantly looking after her own family as well as Shirley. Please pray for them all, especially for the family as well as Shirley and Alf. We don't know how long Alf will be in hospital, but even when he comes home, he probably won't be well enough to care for Shirley. And we pray for Shirley's healing swiftly. Let us come before God in prayers for others. Our Lord and our God, Father and Mother of us all, we come before you with thankful hearts for all you have given us, for the privileged lives we lead, for the freedom of our lives, for our families, our children and our grandchildren, our local communities, and this, our church community, and our partnership with Holy Cross and the many friends we have, have made there. We pray for others not so fortunate as ourselves, those who are homeless, hungry, persecuted. We pray for the people of Ukraine. Give them strength and peace as they try to rebuild their towns and cities. Please, Lord, make the fighting stop. Bring Russia to a place of realization of the futility of war and that Russia will bring the invasion and fighting to an end. This week, the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Prayer Cycle asks us to pray for the African countries of Liberia and Sierra Leone. We are thankful for the natural resources of these countries, that they might benefit the peace and welfare of all. For the diverse ethnic and religious groups who have long lived together in peace and harmony, especially the Muslims and Christians in Sierra Leone, we pray for the democratic ele election of leaders who have brought political stability and accountability. We are thankful for how diseases such as Ebola have been brought under control. We pray for the churches in these countries for their evangelism and social outreach, faithful witness and action in times of conflict and for interfaith cooperation with others. We pray for the majority of the people who are still impoverished, that adequate services and policies will be provided that enable them to live with dignity and good health. We pray for more just governance, free of corruption, accountable to the people, and that manages resources in ways that benefit all. In our presbytery, we pray for the Reverend Liz McMillan, our new Presbytery Minister for Wellbeing, to, and we warmly welcome Liz to the Presbytery. Locally, we pray for St. Columbus. We're thankful for our founders and their faiths, visions and legacy, which have been enjoyed over the years, passed by 
for the years past by and for years to come, for the wisdom of our seniors in the past and present, the blessing through carers that we witness and experience. We pray for our people and carers going through well-being treatments and care. And we pray for our journey as a community of faith, running our race and looking towards Jesus. We pray for our federal government and our territory government that all politicians, both federal and territory, will make decisions that will benefit our societies, our people and the First Nations people of our country. We pray that the Indigenous people of our land will be included in our country's constitution so that they will have a voice and be considered in decision-making by our country's leaders. We thank you for our church community, for friendships formed over many years. We pray for Alf and Shirley Larson, for Beth Campton and her family, for Audrey Calvert and Angus Cameron as they continue their journeys well into their 90s, for Lorraine Mason as she settles into life in New Zealand with her family. And we pray for Joel Swaddling. We thank you that we can celebrate Holy Communion with some of the residents of Goodwood Village in Ainsley and give thanks for the Reverend Don Erickson as he leads us in the Eucharist every month. We pray for Holy Cross, for Tim, Wat for Tim Watson, that he will be well again soon. We pray for his family and for all the people in the Holy Cross congregation. We give thanks for the life of Judy Everall and for her many years of service in our church community. Please give John, Kate and Alison comfort and peace as they remember many happy times together in past years. We pray for the Winkler family in Vermont, USA, friends of Don and Margaret and visitors to our church in past years. We pray for the family of the Reverend Dr. Richard Campbell, the Reverend Clive Gesling, the Reverend Alistair Christie, men who have served you and their communities faithfully over many years and have passed into eternal life. We pray for many others who have recently lost a family member. Bring them peace and comfort. Hear our prayer, dear Lord, and guide us on our continuing journey in this life that you have given us. And we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom is love, your will be done in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, to sin against us. But deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn is together in song number 674, the John Bell hymn, Inspired by Love and Anger. And then if we remain standing for the blessing and our blessing song.
So now we leave this place of worship and while so much of the road ahead is uncertain and the path is constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and as sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know that God is love. We know that Christ's light endures. And we know that the Holy Spirit is here, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord.